Okay, so today we're going to be talking about uh, asynchronous programming. And we're going to go through, uh, start at a kind of a beginner level, um, go through what is asynchronous, how do you sort of think about it, uh, and walk through patterns that help you tame it. Um, so quickly, who am I? Uh, my name is Blake Burns. I work at Blue Fletch Mobile. We build uh, mobile apps for big companies. Um, and I get to work with a lot of really cool technology. So iOS, Android, uh, do some HTML5, some Amazon Web Services, and in a prior life used to do a lot of enterprise Java, but unless you want to talk about Wicket and Tapestry, probably not that useful to what you guys are working on now. Um, all right, so um, wanted to start off with just why are you guys here? Um, so who saw the presentation and just thought, I need to learn uh, that skill? Just raise hands, okay? Um, how about people who've, just, who've done asynchronous programming and have run into callback hell or something else that's just been tough to deal with, okay? Um, and then who just kind of looked at the presentation topic and went, this guy sounds a little crazy, I'm gonna go see what he's gonna talk about. All right, my team over there, great. Um, okay, uh, and then in terms of what you guys currently program in, how many JavaScript people in here? Okay, good number, and Java? All right, a lot of Java guys. Um, for the Java guys, do you also do JavaScript? Okay, good, good. Um, all right, um, and then any .NET guys? One, all right. Um, don't have any .NET examples, but should translate. Okay, so why do I think we're here? Um, so I have a vantage point from the mobile side of the industry, so take it with a grain of salt, but from what I see um, in the industry right now, backends are moving increasingly to APIs that talk to lots of other big backend services, right? Um, so if you're on Amazon Web Services, you're talking to um, three or four different databases that all use REST and so respond asynchronously. Um, and you're building uh, an API that serves multiple rich front-end clients, right? So how many mobile people do we have here? Okay, decent number. Um, anyone planning on getting into mobile? About the same. Um, what about single page apps? Who's building single page apps in Angular or um, Backbone, anything like that, Ember, okay. Um, so what about server-side JavaScript? Anyone doing Node.js in here? Some, okay. Um, so I think we're seeing a lot of changes um, and in a lot of those environments we just talked about, you're increasingly coding in an asynchronous way, right? You're no longer sort of coding in a, I get a request, I follow a chain of events, I return a response, it all goes in order. Um, and some of you are saying, okay, yeah, I know, but it's pretty easy, isn't it? Like, I've, I've done jQuery. That's not too bad. Um, as you start adding um, calls within calls, um, and let's say I clicked on that button and then three web service calls needed to happen, uh, two of them in sequence, um, one at the same time, and then I need to do something at the end of it. It, it gets complicated very quickly. Um, so just cue this up and just start thinking, it's okay to think this. As thinking asynchronously is hard. The good news is, eventually you'll get it. I was hoping Stephen Feather would laugh since he told this joke to me on Twitter and I didn't understand what he was talking about. So wait for it. Eventually you'll get it. It's an async joke. All right, so um, it's important. It's a skill that we're all, we all need to be working on, right? Um, you're gonna run into this more and more, especially as environments try and take advantage of um, this multiple CPUs in your, pro in your uh, environment or you're in the JavaScript world. Um, so this is a real email I got. Um, I was on a project, I rolled off, three months later I got this email and the guy's like, hey, I know you wrote this Titanium project uh, and I've got this code and the Ajax call isn't happening synchronously and it's blowing up my, my, my whole app. So I've got a couple t-shirts up here and the first person who can tell me why this is blowing up um, you can come collect one after the presentation is over. Anyone got any ideas? Yes, all right, come get a shirt afterwards. All right, so data object isn't gonna actually get populated until on load happens, which is asynchronous, right? But this guy was writing code where he said, run the HTTP request and then immediately populate data, and this data object doesn't exist yet, right? So it's important to be able to think about how this code is gonna happen. And don't let this happen to you. Don't write that email to me. So um, let's j enter into our journey. <laughs> Might feel a little painful at first. 
Um, but by the time you're done, you should be able to walk out of here a little heavier, um, hopefully still awake. Um, okay, so um, what is ex uh, async code? At, at its fundamental basic level, it's just code that's going to execute in the future, right? It's going to execute at some point. Um, I had this big analogy to the running man, which is in the background here, um, because he gets executed in the future. But um, I'm not going to go into it because it, it was just too much. Um, all right, so let's start with just an analogy, right? Um, so think about whenever you're walking out your door um, and you're like, okay, I got to do these five things and then I need to remember when I exit the building, lock the door. In some ways, you are queuing up an asynchronous event that you know you're going to run when you leave um, and you are going to go and do a bunch of other stuff in the meantime and you get to that door and you go, oh, I got to run that function, right? And maybe you're not quite that technical, but you do it, right? Um, and so you are, in some ways, an asynchronous machine. Uh, just a quick aside, I wrote Own Genius and thought, oh my god, I'm so smart. Um, and then I Googled it, and it's like a thing, so. <laughs> um, all right, so um, this is the first thing you run into when you look at asynchronous code, and you go, oh, OK, things are actually happening a little bit different than I expected, right? So this is, this is obvious, right? I, I look at that code, and I know it's going to go one click two, three. Um, all of a sudden, I throw this very, very small little uh, kink in the mix, and now it's one, and then three actually prints out first. Um, and then two happens only if I click the button, right? So for most of you, this is probably really obvious. Don't worry, the presentation is not going to stay at this level. Um, but just to get you thinking about what does asynchronous mean, why is it different, right? Um, so one of the most important reasons we do asynchronous code um, is that if we wrote code this way, um, and you just always kept downloading stuff, and maybe some of you do write code this way, I hope not. Um, but if you just keep downloading stuff, you're not giving uh, the processor time to draw your UI, right? So in, um, what you're really looking to do is, um, it is allow, especially in a JavaScript environment, allow it time to queue your events up and run them when it has time, right? If we wrote code that just looked like this, essentially, um, while a user hasn't clicked and just keep checking, 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 you'd never get here. You'd never actually run your click handler. Um, so very quickly, uh, the event loop in JavaScript, JavaScript is a single threaded environment, and essentially I have uh, native level um, functions into my IO, my uh, Ajax requests, uh, and I give them a callback function when I run them, right? So when they're done, uh, they actually put the callback function into a stack, uh, in, into a message queue that I read off of when I have time. And so it's important to know that when I write code that puts something into a function that goes in that message queue, I actually allow the process to run more things at once uh, than I would if I just tried to do that while loop. So this is a topic that can literally be a 75 minute topic. We're gonna stop right there and keep moving forward. Um, same thing in mobile, right? I need to think about, uh, I have a main thread that's responsible for drawing my user interface, making sure that things update quickly, and I have about 16 milliseconds uh, to actually um, draw that same, the, you have a measure, compute, draw cycle that happens over and over again. Um, and to, to get a 60 frame per second fluid feeling UI, uh, you have 16 milliseconds. So in mobile, you end up throwing things to background threads. Again, they're going to run asynchronously. When they're done, I'm going to pull them back and I'm going to update my UI. All right, so that's pretty much it, right? Um, no, there's a lot more to talk about. Okay, so let's just start off by why is it hard to think about this stuff, right? Um, in some ways, you are transiting to functional thinking. And I don't know if you guys have gotten a chance to go to any of the presentations um, that have talked about that, but you're transitioning from thinking sequentially about code to thinking about units that are going to run at some future time. And they may happen uh, at some future time and impact what's going on um, in the current time that impacts the future, and you may disappear. Um, I'm making analogies again that don't make sense because I wanted to put the DeLorean in there. Um, you do have functions inside of functions, right? Um, and that makes it really hard to reason about what's going on. Um, and then this one is tough because I'm going to register a callback. Um, I'm going to do a bunch of code. And then when it finishes, I want to run something. There's a chance that when it's ready to run, your view or your fragment is no longer there. Uh, and so we have to think about things that, that don't happen in a synchronous environment. 
Okay, so how does it go wrong? Um, this is a really quick summary. Um, if you write your code and it goes up and down, you're good, right? The second it starts going out into nested calls within nested calls within nested calls, um, you are heading towards a world that we commonly call um, callback hell or the pyramid of doom. Uh, and it becomes very, very difficult to maintain your code. Um, so let's look at a really quick example, just kind of give you guys a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, simple stuff, right? Load a blog, load the author, load some comments. Um, hopefully you can read this, but the idea is not to digest this. It's just, you see I've got a couple calls. I'm going to get the comments and the user at the same time. Um, and then I'm going to loop through the comments and get uh, the author for each, right? So just to illustrate, um, then they come back and they say, hey, we actually want to have featured blogs. Um, and you're like, okay, cool. I'm going to build that in right at the top. Uh, and then I'll nest off if it, if it um, isn't a featured blog. And all I'm trying to show you here is this is how it begins. This is where you start down this path. Um, and they just keep going, right? And in, unless you refactor diligently, you will eventually run into this world. <laughs> it, this is just, you know. Hopefully, I don't have to tell you that this, whenever you see these comments, it's time to refactor. Um, just so you can see it all together. <laughs> all right, so hopefully you are convinced um, about the problem. So let's move into some solutions. Okay, so um, patterns, right? We're gonna go through a few different ways that you can tame callbacks. Um, some of them are in Java, some of them are in, most of them are in JavaScript. I had iOS, I didn't ask if anyone here was iOS. I took them out because I was told that was not a good idea and there was too much stuff in here. Um, okay, so start with callbacks, right? You've seen these, you know what they are. Um, you've run into them a bunch of times. We've got one on JavaScript, read a big file and then when you're done, run something else, right? Um, a callback isn't always going to be asynchronous, but in the case of most things where I'm calling um, Ajax or I'm calling a file operation, it will be asynchronous. This will go into a message queue when this event is done, and then I'll run it whenever I have time. Um, so Java, um, a little bit harder to read, but you guys said a lot of you are Java developers, so this probably looks natural. Um, and then just quickly, round of applause for Java 8. All right, good. Okay, so when should you use callbacks? So I'm gonna give you this big presentation about patterns and how to deal with asynchronous code. And then at the end of the day, you actually should probably be using a, just callbacks in the majority of the cases, right? If you're not doing something fancy, if you're not doing multiple things at once, don't go away from this presentation and think, I need to use promises for everything. I need to use async.js. This works most of the time, right? Don't overcomplicate things just because I'm giving you other tools in the toolbox. Um, but for most use cases, um, this is good. It's easy to read, it's built in. People kind of understand what's going on when they read your code, right? Um, so where can it go wrong? Okay, um, this is a little faded out, but um, you might be doing things wrong if you read the code synchronously, right? If you're looking at that code and you, you don't reason that um, that function is going to happen in that future date, and you do that mind shift, right? You look at the code and you go, okay, pull that up to the side because I know it's not happening right now. Um, and I've traced through with a number of developers just looking through code and saying, okay, what's going to happen next? Um, and that idea takes a little while to understand, right? So make sure that at a fundamental level, you don't think things through synchronously. Um, if you start creating callbacks in callbacks, um, one, you're maybe okay, but you're heading down the path, right? Start thinking about, do I need to, to change things up a little bit? Um, and then if you don't call the callback, so if you've ever written code in Node.js, um, if you've written JavaScript code that depends on a callback being called, if you don't call that, if you've got branch logic that has a few different pathways through it, um, and there's one where the callback never happens, um, you will sit there and nothing will happen. So make sure to call that callback. Okay, so you might be overthinking it. I hope this isn't too blurry. This is a weeding machine. Um, if you're always using something else, right? If you're never using callbacks, just plain callbacks, you might be overdoing it. And that's a maybe, but there's a good chance. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna add on to callbacks, right? We've got the basics down. 
uh, are callback libraries. And so at a fundamental level, I'm taking callbacks and I'm running them sequentially, or I'm running them in parallel. And I'm, I'm using libraries that help me um, wait for things to finish, right? Maybe I run five Ajax calls in a row, uh, and then after the, fifth, after the fifth one, I need to make, collect all the data and display the logic, or display the UI, right? Um, okay, so very quickly, if you're not familiar with Node.js callbacks, um, this is what they look like. They sort of settled on this pattern of the first parameter is always an error, and then you put data and stuff afterwards, right? Um, this runs into this common problem where you accidentally call next with your data, and then it just crashes and stops. Um, if you use Node.js, and actually this works in the client side as well, there's this great library called AsyncJS. Um, and this is an example of um, running um, two functions in parallel, right? So I'm actually going to download a blog and download users both at the same time. And when they're both done, um, I'm going to pull the results out and go ahead and display things. Um, so this is really powerful, right? I can take code, and you'll see in a second, I can actually swap out whether I want to run these sequentially or I want to run them in parallel. Um, and I have this ability now to very easily test whether or not these are done at the same time. If you've tried to do this on your own, uh, you will end up with some sort of hacky array that you put Boolean variables into different spots and you check whether they're all there or not. Um, if you've done that, um, I applaud you on your creativity, um, but this is a much easier way to do it. Um, this is a cool little extra that you can use here. You can say limit to five at once. Um, so waterfall, same thing as series. Um, switch it up and say run these in sequence. Um, so get the blog, and then once I have the blog, and it's going to go in my first parameter, um, get the blog users, and then I'm aggregating up my parameters here, um, get the avatars, and then when I'm all done, go ahead and display, right? So I can do this sequence of things. I can build up my parameter list um, and then display. So async's got a bunch of other features. Um, I'm not going to cover all of them, but um, these are the same things. If you've ever done functional programming, they basically transform a list or an array values. Um, these are ways to do this uh, asynchronously, right? So instead of a map that runs in order, I actually run them all at once um, and get all the results at the end. Um, and it, it's very handy, for instance, when I just did that example of comments and then downloading the users, I can map that, um, the comments, and run all of the downloads at once. That's a really quick way to do that. OK, so on Android, um, and this is just Java in general, um, there's a framework called Bolts. Uh, it's by Facebook. Um, and you actually have continuations, which are somewhere in between callbacks and promises. Um, they're not true promises. We'll get into what that means in a second. Um, but I have this task um, object that essentially can either get an error or a result. Um, and so when I chain them together, um, you can see that this code is really hard to look at. Um, but I essentially look, at, look for the output here, not necessarily how complicated this looks. Um, but I create a task, and then I keep continuing it with the next task. Right here, you can see that I continue with task, and I delete all these. What results is that by the time I'm done, all my comments are deleted, um, and I'm ready to move forward, maybe delete the original blog that it came from. OK, um, so when should I use things like this? Um, when, yeah, got a question. Yes, yeah. OK, so um, when should I use these? Um, when I start getting those nesting, right? I start getting callbacks within callbacks. Um, this is a pattern to deal with that, right? I, I can start thinking about pulling things out. And one of the things I'm going to say a couple times, and hopefully you take this one with you, um, at the end of the day, you're always looking for your code to start looking vertical, right? When you start noticing it going towards hell, remember the chart before, or the, the road sign? Um, you want to pull it back towards the middle, right? Aim for one nesting deep in your code. Um, so when you see that, this is a good time to start pulling it in. Uh, and we'll cover promises, and we're not going to go into reactive programming, but when you start um, seeing that stuff, you may have a preference towards one or the other. Um, this is an alternative if you decide you don't like promises. Um, all right, so we kind of saw you have a consistent structure. It's clean. Um, the Java code may be arguably not clean. Um, but you, you have code that at least follows something that, if I'm using this library consistently, um, I can understand what's going on and how the code is flowing. Um, all right, so I promised at the very beginning some quicksand shoes. 
Um, so what can go wrong here? Um, you hit reply all. Um, all right, so you can still run into the same thing, right? One of the common things that happens when you use async.js is you start writing code and then it just stalls and you don't know what happened. Um, and usually it's because somewhere in that branch code you forgot to call the callback. So you're never allowing it to go to the next um, function. Um, we talked about this briefly. Um, this is more of a node problem, but when you start using that async library, uh, if you do forget to, or if you send your data in that first parameter, um, it will jump out of all your code and drop into that error function. Um, so something that happens a decent amount. Uh, and really commonly, people look at that async code and they put a try catch around the whole thing. Um, the challenge there is that code is not running right there. So your execution context for the individual functions is actually different than the, where your try catch is. So if you do try catch, you need to try catch inside of each function block. Um, and so asynchronous catching uh, actually a little bit of a complex problem. Okay, you might be over engineering it, Vista. Uh, if um, you're using it for single callbacks, right? If you see this code and there's just one callback in it, you might be overdoing it, possibly. Um, if you try and roll your own version of this, um, I think that's probably self-explanatory, but don't run your, roll your own version of these codes. Uh, pretty complex what's going on under the hood. Um, and if you start seeing parallel functions inside waterfall functions, um, good sign you want to rethink about how your code is, is laid out, right? So if I start seeing nesting inside of nesting and I'm like, oh, I'm using async, so isn't that what he told me to do, right? I'm, I'm putting structure around it. Um, if you're doing parallel inside of a sequence, you probably want to at least make that its own function so that you're testing um, and you're thinking about things at least on one level of asynchronous patterns. Okay, so uh, we're gonna go into the delegation pattern. Um, so the delegation pattern at its simplest level is uh, I have a one-to-one -one mapping where I hand off control to another um, object, right? Um, so in Android, if you've ever done any Android development, um, this code uh, gets auto-generated whenever you create a fragment, right? I have a listener that the fragment um, will implement uh, or will, will expose out, um, and then my activity actually implements it. And what this lets me do is talk two ways between my fragment and my activity. So inside of my fragment, um, I can check if I should accept click, um, and I can tell the activity when my actual value has changed. So the, the strength of this pattern is I can decouple things. Um, I can register and handle events in a different layer, and it's not always activity to fragment. It can be other things. Um, but just imagine that I'm handing off control to someone else. Um, and then just to complete this example, on the other side, on the fragment, um, when the activity attaches, uh, not important what's going on in the life cycle here, but I get a hold of that listener, and then that's how I'm going to send up events. Okay, so when do you use this one? Um, the main pattern is if I have data adapters or view presenters, right? So you see this a lot in UI. Um, a lot of the Android and iOS code is built around this pattern. Um, so I hand off control to someone, and sometimes it's just because that's the simplest way to control between framework, library level code, uh, and something that I'm going to write myself. Um, so a, an actual service instance, if you have a service that literally just is for a single activity or view, or you're on um, the JavaScript guide and you're, you're very coupled, um, and you have an instance, you can sometimes use the delegate pattern to hand control back and forth. Um, we'll get into some of the fallbacks of that. Um, but the great things here, this is one of the only asynchronous patterns where you can actually have two-way control. In almost everything else, I register a callback and then I handle the code um, somewhere else, right? Some future time that I can't talk back to whoever has registered with me unless I do a new asynchronous event. Um, so you've got two-way control, which this is, whenever you need that two-way control, this can be the pattern that you want, you want to go with. Um, and this is kind of an understated thing in most asynchronous code, but just being able to read what you're expecting me to do, to have an interface that says, I need you to override A, B, and C in order to work with me. Um, when we get into the observer pattern and message buses, you lose some of this. Okay, so where does this one go wrong? Where can you get into some problems? 
All right, um, we're gonna do a very quick speed test. Who's this guy? Or I have no idea who has said that first. It was too fast. All right, whoever said it first, you can come get a shirt afterward. Um, all right, so um, what can go wrong here? If you do start building interfaces that have um, that two-way control, keep them light, keep them small, especially in Java where you've got to override everything. Um, you can end up putting too much in one place. Um, you forget to deregister. So if I do um, register a delegate in my front end, uh, and my front end changes from one view to the next, um, and I don't deregister this callback, and it, later on um, the delegate calls functions that are on that view, um, you will blow up. So just be aware that when you run with patterns like this, and this is going to be true in a lot of the patterns we'll look at, you do need to deregister almost everything, right? So a part of thinking about it, remember that bike, keep that in the top of your mind. Always think about when you're writing this code, you need to make sure that you um, unregister. Okay, um, and then this last one, um, so we talked a little bit about having a service layer that has that kind of one-to-one -one mapping um, with a, a delegate. And you can do that. Um, again, it, it'll run into some of its own problems. So if I start switching between multiple fragments and I'm changing um, this delegate pattern in the background, there are some cases where you're going to end up with some problems where the delegate doesn't get registered in time. And really what you're looking for is an observer pattern. We'll get into that one in a second. Um, actually, right now. Okay, so anyone in the room know who this is? Yeah, well, okay. Man, I am not good at figuring out who said that. I think it was you. All right. Um, it's, it's actually Stephen Feather. He's in the back of the room. Um, just kidding. Anybody who went to the Titanium uh, uh, talk knows that joke. Um, all right, so uh, what does an observer do? Right At its base level, and you're going to see this one everywhere, um, all you're listening for is state changes, right? I have observers, and it's one to many, that say, did you change, right? If it's a UI, it's did something click you? Um, did your text change in a field? Um, if it's a model, it's did your actual state internally change, right? I've got a variable that, that changed um, from one to two. Um, as an observable, I'm broadcasting that state out to one or more listeners. I don't know who they are, right? I just keep a list of subscribers. I send out changes. This pattern is everywhere. If you've ever done any work with the DOM or Backbone, um, it's very, very common, right? Um, this is Backbone code where uh, it's unfortunately small. Um, but on, on my view, I'm actually going to have the model listen for changes, listen for on destroy, um, and react, right? Um, the power here is um, this model doesn't know anything about this view. It's dealing with its own stuff. It's just broadcasting out when things change. It's a very good way to decouple uh, my model change from my views. Um, and on Node.js, this is actually it may look a little complicated, but I can add observability to my own objects really easily. Um, and it's a, it's a bizarre pattern where you use it all the time. You see it in the DOM, in any mobile code, um, but you rarely add it to your own code in, from what I've seen. Um, but it's a very powerful thing, and it's very simple to do. So there's this Node.js event emitter um, that I can just mix into my class, and now I can emit change events and have other people register for them. Um, on a Android, just a quick example, um, this is the observer pattern, right? You, you've seen this all over the place. You've probably used it. Um, take it to that next level and think about, can I use this in my own code? So when should I use it? Um, I think the, if your models or views are changing, this is a great way to have decoupled listeners react to those changes. Um, if you're using something like Backbone um, or another framework, it's, it's oftentimes built in, and so you'll use this without even thinking about it. Um, there are times where it's nice to mix in other patterns as well, uh, and we'll get into some of those um, in a second. Uh, the DOM is obviously You've all probably seen this. You've probably used it. Maybe you didn't know that that was the observer pattern. Um, but just think about how you're using that. Um, and I said this at one point, and I think it's true. Um, all of the browser authors and the original specs of, uh, of the DOM, those guys, half the time you look up these patterns, you're like, where did this start? And someone in like 1976 wrote a paper on it, um, and then it's just now picking up steam. Like Promises, written in 1976, and just now is starting to get a lot of attention, right? Um, when a, pot, when a pattern is used in a lot of places, um, there's usually a good reason, right? There's a lot of smart people that 
were looking at it and thought this is the right way to go. Okay, so um, the great things, we talked about this a little bit, but the loose coupling gives you a lot of power, right? I can listen to something it doesn't need to know about me. Um, I'm listening to some specific object, right? So I, I pick a button or a specific model, and I just want to know when that one changes. So we're going to get into another pattern in a second uh, message bus, and it's broadcasting everything you can think of, right? And it's a great pattern for decoupling things. The problem is um, I am no longer looking at a specific object and saying only tell me when you change, when oftentimes that's what I truly want. Uh, and you can have one or many subscribers, right? So I can have a bunch of people. The delegate pattern really stops at one-to-one -one, um, and you turn into um, the one-to-many uh, when you turn into an observer. Okay, so where does it go wrong? Um, again, you have to deregister all this stuff, right? I, I'm queuing up things that are gonna run eventually. And there's a really good chance if you're doing it from a view, that view is gonna be gone. So always deregister. Everything in the async world needs to be deregistered, except for Rx, which does it for you. Um, okay, so waiting for events that already happened. So a lot of times you'll see observable code, and Backbone's a good example of this, where you load the state synchronously and then you start listening for changes. Um, that's just kind of a part of the observable pattern. It doesn't have built in load my state in this block and also start listening. Um, so you're always gonna end up having that code with this pattern. Um, and then lastly, it, it's, it can be poorly documented, right? When I'm broadcasting out events, um, there are so many times that I've looked in um, client side code or Node.js code just to figure out what is even available. Um, so I lose a little bit of that interface capability when I go down this path. Okay, we're gonna do it. Raise my hand and tell me what this is. Yes, this is someone wrote an actual processor inside of Minecraft. So come get a shirt afterward. Uh, you can get it afterwards. Um, so probably overkill. Um, you may be going down an overkill path if you roll your own, right? If you write your own version of this, um, possibly heading down that path. If you looked at the observer pattern and went, awesome, how do I bind this? How do I start reacting and auto-linking up my different um, observables and keeping state inside of them, and you jump straight to reactive, there's a chance you're overdoing it. Maybe that is the right path for you, um, but just know that the, this pattern works pretty well for a lot of things. Um, similarly, if you take this path and you always start trying to, you know, you look at it and you're like, man, I keep writing code where I listen for changes and I update the UI, um, and I really want to get to that level where like, I don't even write that code. Um, there are times where that's great. Uh, there are also times where there's a chance you're overdoing it. Um, and if I go towards that message bus kind of immediately, right, um, uh, in my observer pattern very quickly turns into, um, I've abstracted it so far that I'm just listening now at some level and filtering on common events um, really, you've actually created a message bus. You've stopped observing individual objects. Um, and so be aware that you can get carried away with this pattern pretty easily. Okay, so we're gonna go into another pattern here. Um, promises is probably something you've all heard a lot about. Um, it gets a, a lot of hype right now. Um, just got it added to uh, e ES6. Um, so it's going to be a part of the JavaScript spec going forward. Um, and it's, it's um, basically the, the biggest thing that you get with it is a lot of people think it looks synchronous. So when you look at promises code, it looks like you're writing code that's gonna run in order. Um, and so people get excited about it. Um, the first thing you learn about promises that is actually pretty cool um, is that, well actually I'm gonna go through a very quick definition here. Just so if you don't know what promises are, um, it's kind of hard to get your head around, but once you figure it out, it, it's a pretty powerful pattern. So at, at the basic level, it's an object. Um, so don't think of it as a function, think of it as an object um, that always either resolves or rejects. That it can only do one or the other, and in the true promises spec, um, it can only do, only do one or the other once, right? So there's only a single time uh, that I will resolve, which gives you some cool side effects. I can actually cache the result of a promise, keep it around and reuse it again. Um, so it will not change that first time. After that first time, that's it. Um, so another T-shirt available for the name of this movie. I think it was you. I think it was you. Yep. All right. Yeah, you got two. I got pens too. You can tell what was. Um, 
Um, all right, so the Pyramid of Doom, right? Remember what this looks like. Um, so when we add a library like Q in JavaScript, um, those steps start to go towards um, vertical, right? That up and down that we're looking for. So instead of running things that nest within other functions that nest within other functions, um, I've actually got promises that run sequentially. Um, and each one is going to bubble up values, right? Within each um, callback, I can actually return data that will go to the next step. And at any level here, um, I can catch errors. So I talked about earlier, try catches in async code is really hard. Promises have actually solved that problem to some degree. So if anything bubbles up or I re manually return an error, it's all going to go into my catch function. Um, and I can catch specific functions as well, or specific errors as well. Um, and then this done basically signals that I don't want anything to happen afterwards if it does um, go ahead and actually blow up. OK, so what's inside one of these? So we talked briefly about what is a promise. Um, sometimes it looks like magic, and you read them, and you write them, and you go, OK, cool, I got it. And then it comes time to write your own, and you have no idea where to start. Um, so you start by creating a, what's called a deferred object. And that deferred is either going to reject or resolve on this promise. So when I write code, I'm actually interacting with this promise. And we'll see in a second, I'm going to deal with that rejection or that resolve. The rejection is going to go back to that catch block we were looking at a second ago. And the resolve is going to step me down to the next block. So this is also a way to translate um, an old Node.js function into a promise. Um, all right, so this is a more complicated example, but kind of want to show you a little bit of the power of what you can do here. Right? So if I start with um, getting a username, it's going to asynchronously um, return the username. Right? Maybe it's stored in, um, in uh, secure preferences or something. Um, I'm going to load directly from a cache. Right? It's just a straight dictionary um, object that lives, hash that lives right in my, my function or in my um, object here. Um, and then I'm going to return up two parameters. And you can see that I'm returning directly here. I'm not returning something that's going to happen asynchronously. This is going to return just a regular variable. And in this next one, I optionally return um, either that user that happened right here that I got right there, or I return a promise. And maybe this promise is going to go to the back end or to the database. Those are both going to go to this next function. And so you can start to see that I'm mixing synchronous and asynchronous code that all bubbles up as if it's happening in that natural flow. This is what gets people excited about some of the potential of what you can do with promises. So we looked at that parallel function um, in the Q library. You have the equivalent, or sorry, in async, um, you have the equivalent in Q, right? So I can run these two at the same time. Um, and it's very easy to integrate. You can use this uh, client side. Um, or in a Node.js environment, right? So I can actually uh, have jQuery start to behave like promised uh, behavior. So you, for those of you who use jQuery a lot, you're probably going, yeah, it kind of already has that. Um, there's a deferred spec that doesn't follow exactly the same thing as promises. You can actually resolve multiple times. There's a number of flaws with the way jQuery implements this. Um, so Q lets you standardize a little easier. Uh, and then this lets you call into native Node.js functions. All right, so on Android, uh, there's actually a cool library called jDeferred. Um, it does not implement a perfect promises spec, um, but it does give you a lot of these things that we just looked at, right? I can call then, I can call done. Um, I have a catch, it's called fail, um, and I can combine them. So uh, Java example, but Kayla's not expressed, impressed. So put lambdas back in. A little easier to read now. Um, and you can see this is what we were talking about before, right? I can resolve immediately, um, or I can load from a REST service, and they're both going to come down into this callback block. So the big advantage here um, is before we talked about in the observable pattern, um, I usually load state and then start listening. Um, in the promises pattern, and they're not solving the exact same thing, but I can have one callback uh, that's going to draw my view, and it's going to happen both times. Um, so for those of you that are in the Java world, um, pretty heavily. Java 8 um, actually has something that's pretty similar um, that's going to be built in. Um, so it's called a completable future. Uh, and you can sort of recognize that it's a pretty similar syntax. Um, it's not exactly the same, but you can chain things up and you can get code that runs asynchronously 
to chain together and tell me when it's all done. Okay, so when do you use this, right? This is an alternative to those async libraries. If I wanna run a bunch of stuff in parallel, a bunch of stuff in sequence, uh, this is a good way to go ahead and do that. Um, example there, right? If I, um, we built an app in Android recently with this framework um, and it would go to the database and then if um, our object wasn't in the database, it would go to a service um, and no matter how it loaded it, it would call the callback at the end and say, all right, I've got data, right? Got some form of data. Um, so it's a good way to have your pattern always filter down um, and, and always give you the, the result you're looking for. Um, so we talked a little bit about in the new version of JavaScript, um, promises are built in. In the new version of Java, they're kind of built in. So this is going to be increasingly a pattern that people will start using or continue using built in. Okay, so um, it mimics synchronous code, right? We, we looked at it, you can kind of see that I've got that natural top to bottom flow, right? Um, the error handling of all of the asynchronous patterns we've looked at and we will look at, this is kind of the only one that solves a problem of having asynchronous errors happen. Um, errors that bubble up in nested functions that may happen at some future time, and I wanna always know when things failed. Uh, all pass exit, so it's harder to not have a promise give you a result one way or another than in the async libraries uh, and in the libraries where, um, well, yeah, in async that we looked at before. Um, and then that last big piece, I can asynchronously resolve or I can resolve immediately. That, that lets me look up caching and have code that doesn't have a bunch of different branches, always sort of handles it in the same place. Okay, so where does promises go wrong? Um, the first one is there's a lot of different implementations. About, well, recently there was a spec that came out called promises slash A plus where they tried to actually standardize on what should promises look like, how should they behave, um, and that's helping. There's a lot of people implementing that right now. Um, one thing to check when you do choose a library like Q or RSVP, or Win, there's a bunch of them, um, check that it's actually implementing that, that spec. Um, it's a good sign that you're ready to kind of use it. And it's, they're at least keeping up with things. Um, this is a personal thing I've found, but when you start chaining together code and it looks kind of synchronous, but it's actually doing really complicated nested functions that may be happening with a backend or a rest call, um, when you write it in line, it tends to make you not write unit tests that aren't big old integration tests for the whole block of code. Um, when you write async code, I find that you tend to immediately pull it off into its own function. So just a thing that I've personally noticed and just to be aware of, make sure you start pulling your code off so that you test smaller units. If you do start trying to test these big eight step flows that can have lots of different things happen in them, you will run into bugs that are impossible to replicate. So do test those smaller chunks. Um, Deregister. I'm not even gonna say anything about that one again. You guys know that one by now, I hope. Um, so this is another personal one that I almost see no one talking about. In the promises world, if I, I have two options for catching errors. There's, there's either you give it a, a callback that says I succeeded or a callback that says I failed. And we didn't look at that. Or you do that catch. And one of the things I've seen a few developers do is you write eight things in a row and then you catch. I'm like, okay, would you write this if you were writing Java code? Would you have written um, 50 things and nested them all in a try catch? Probably not, right? You probably would have caught um, localized errors and thought about how do I want to deal with individual things or you would have given them their own type and bubbled those up. So think about that when you're doing promises. You don't want to necessarily have one big catch block for a big old chain of promises. All right, so um, promises hell. So I talked about callback hell and promises is a pattern that helps you solve some things but you still can write promises that live within promises that live within promises. So it's not going to save you from that unless you let it. So I'll let that sink in for a second, but always be thinking about pulling back to that vertical line, right? Promises will let you return and start again from the next line, start again from the next block, right? I just start again in the next then. Um, if you do that, you're gonna stay vertical, you're not gonna have callback or promises hell, but you can still head down that path. So beware of it. Um, and then lastly, I, I find that promises are easy to look at um, and there's that initial learning curve of just writing your own. That can be a challenge. Um, think about how you're gonna introduce people to this and how you're gonna get them 
um, writing promises originally. I, I think one of the things that helps with this is just read a tutorial. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people start into promises and never actually read anything about them and then go back and they're like, I don't actually understand how any of this works. Um, just start there, it makes life a little easier. Okay, so some signs that, oh, you can't see this that well, but this is a cat suffocating another cat. Um, <laughs> Um, signs that you may be annoying people on your team, maybe they're not telling you. Um, if you're the guy on the team that keeps rewriting everyone's code and converting everything to promises, and you guys didn't talk about, I think we should move forward collectively as promises, no one's probably telling you, but they, they're probably a little annoyed. So just be aware that you have a discussion as a team, decide you're gonna go down this path because it is a little bit different looking and code bases that have half of the stuff written in promises and the other half not, or that someone just took it upon themselves to just move us all over, um, it can be a little overwhelming. So likewise, if you just keep insisting on using promises in, in your code, you guys didn't talk about having a standard of promises, um, this also gets you into a world where half your code base is using it. It's just a little hard to maintain. Okay, so the message bus pattern, this is our last pattern we're gonna go through. Um, at a basic level, a message bus is really, really simple. You have one object, and all it can do is publish messages and subscribe to messages. And you usually get an instance of that object, um, whether that's in your view or your activity, um, and you say subscribe to um, a new post created event. Uh, and then somewhere in your back end, you create a new post and you say publish out a new post created event, and that's the gist of this pattern. It's, it's brilliant in its simplicity. Um, it is very easy to overuse. So we'll go through a little bit of this pattern. This is it, this is the whole, this is what your code looks like. Um, this is a library by Jake Wharton. He's a really active contributor to the Android open source community. Um, this library is called auto. Um, and you can see that it's gonna automatically take any answer events and subscribe them. And this uh, method will get called um, if I have subscribed my activity to answer, or to just the hub, right? Uh, so JavaScript, very simple example here. You've got two layers of actual nesting here, so I can do a channel and a topic. This is called PostalJS. You'll actually see message buses built into most JavaScript frameworks, right? So jQuery's got some stuff, Angular's got some stuff. You have the ability to um, emit messages at a global scope most of the time. Um, this is what it looks like to write, to publish out. Um, so you can see it's not a very complicated pattern to implement or to use. Um, and it, it is a great way to have single truth events go throughout your system. And that's the important part of a message bus. If there is a single truth that can happen for your event, it's perfect, right? It's a great way to just um, have completely decoupled uh, objects, listen to your central bus and, and um, react. Uh, if I have multiple libraries and I don't want them talking directly to each other. Again, great way to kind of broadcast messages. Um, I can actually have um, everyone um, register themselves. Uh, they never even talk to them. And then you hook yourself into the bus, react to the events, um, and, and do your thing, right? Nobody even needs to know about each other. Um, if I want, again, that single truth setup, if I want a login event or a logout event, uh, or a finished downloading event to go out to my whole system, this is the right pattern. This is the easiest way to do that, not tie everything together. Um, if I start heading down a path of like what I showed in that first example, um, let's see if I can go back real quick. Uh, so I have an answer event, but it's actually tied to answer 42. Um, I'm now gonna start filtering. Um, and that, that actually starts you down a path of um, being a little complicated, right? I now have to, every time I get a message, start thinking about, is this the right message for me? And at some level, you're actually heading towards the observer pattern. I actually wanna just listen to the state of, let's say that was an update, right? Answer 42 updated. And I keep getting that message bus message in, and I filter and I say, is this for answer 42? Because any answer event is gonna come into that same um, method. Uh, if you can't filter, your life is gonna be really hard. So when you look at, um, libraries, auto doesn't have any filter. You're gonna do that by yourself. Um, so make sure when you do that, that you think about that. 
Okay, so the great things here, right? People love this pattern, especially you get someone who looks at it and goes, this is just amazing. Nothing is hooked up directly. I register a component. It just starts listening. I deal with events um, whenever I want to. Everything works independently. Um, it's, it's very powerful in that sense. Um, and we're gonna have a few things that I'm gonna look at where it's easy to overdo this pattern. And you may not see it coming. All right, so um, some things that could bite you. Um, if I've been handed a lot of code bases in the mobile world, and there's this pattern, especially on iOS, where people will start using what's called the NS Default Notification Center, and it is a message bus, and you will start looking for events that publish events that publish events um, that are spread throughout your whole code base. And sometimes there's four or five instances of them, it makes your code really hard to figure out how to change, how things are actually working together, where they're happening. So one of the things that you need to always keep in mind whenever you use this pattern, be very careful of where things are happening and how someone is gonna read it. Um, so the next thing that happens with this pattern um, is you start looking at it and you go, okay, let's do everything through the bus. Um, and you start saying, okay bus, uh, load me answer 42 and then you wait for it to come back, um, and then you realize that every time you show your page, you get a big white flash because it's actually asynchronously loading your data, and what you really wanted was load the data before I start displaying that view. Um, that pattern, this pattern will get you to do that occasionally, so just something to be aware of. Um, and then we talked about this already. Um, make sure that you can filter on a specific event. Okay, so overdone, that is chicken. Um, if you start down that path of I put a message on a bus and then I start listening, um, occasionally what's going to happen is you're going to put a message onto that bus, someone's going to close your view, and then someone's going to open another view, and they're going to put a message onto the bus, and they're going to get the response from that first message that got put on there. And it's not actually the one you want. So until you start filtering on things, you're getting the wrong data, right? And you're like, why is it loading the wrong one? But it only happens sometimes. Um, and so it's a pattern that is going to happen. If you want to load a specific object, sometimes it's actually a lot cleaner and easier to use a repository directly, use the data access layer directly, and just load it, and then start listening for events. If this is your only pattern, right, if you start migrating towards, let's not use the observer pattern, let's just make everything a message bus, um, it can get dirty. You can end up with some of those things we are talking about where everything is filtering, at the end of the day, I really want to know when I load question 12, and then I want to listen for updates on question 12. That's the observer pattern, right? The easiest way to do that is load it, and then listen to changes. Um, oh, and one other point on that. When you are using the observer pattern, this is a great way to have the global scoped events, right? The message bus is a great way to, to add that extra layer. It's very powerful as an add-on. Um, and then, talked about this briefly, but if Usually if we do use a message bus, there's a general rule, and this is kind of a rule I use with most things, but most things, but don't let events start publishing events. If, if you ever start publishing events inside of an event, um, talk about other ways to do that. Because you're gonna end up with code that becomes very, very difficult to figure out what's going on and how it flows through it. Okay, so a few quick things that we're gonna talk about um, that uh, we're not gonna actually go deep into. If you went to the ES6 um, presentation or you know anything about .NET, this is a popular thing where people are putting um, async keywords into your code. It's gonna flatten your code and so you, it really does read synchronously, but it still comes with a number of the same problems of how do I run things, um, eight things at once, or wait for things to be done. Um, so we're not gonna go into those, um, but just to be aware of. Um, and then this is reactive programming. This is how it feels when you try and learn reactive programming. Um, looks like there's a talk coming up next, um, should be pretty interesting, but man, it's every pattern we just talked about lumped into one framework, um, so it, it can be hard to get going on it. Um, I don't have time to talk about it right now, um, but it is a cool pattern and it's very useful in certain circumstances. Um, so, okay, so quickly, um, we've got about 10 minutes, want to just go through, um, we've got 15 minutes. I uh, want to go through how to use this, right? Don't be using the tipex on the screen. 
the whiteout. I lived in Europe for a while. Um, okay, so this is kind of, um, some of you are gonna look at these slides and go, that's, that's not right. Um, and that's, right, that's tech. Um, <laughs> this is my opinion of where I think a lot of these patterns fit. Um, so happy to talk to you guys afterwards if you disagree, I hope some of you do. Um, but in your service layer, I personally think using promises in those callback coordinators, so your async JS, your promises, those are great ways to add coordination across my database and my REST calls um, and anything that I need to run in sequence or in parallel. Um, and then if I have a log out event or a log in event or an error happen, a message bus is a great way to broadcast that out. Um, in my models, um, this is a surprisingly hard thing to do, or not a surprisingly, surprisingly not hard thing to do that people just don't do. Um, but making your models observable, right? Make it so that someone can register for changes on them um, and react to them. Uh, it's a really easy way to, to allow myself to update my view when things change. Uh, and when I do, if I go with an active record model where I have save and update, create, delete on my actual model, uh, promise is a great way to make sure that if I return those, someone who uses my model can, can add promises to those. So in my views and controllers, um, being able to use that observer pattern, um, it's natural, you're kind of going to do this no matter what, because all of the um, view patterns use this. Um, using delegates for view presenters, uh, if I have a very closely coupled service, another place that a delegate is a really good match. Um, and then in the message bus, if there's like a single truth event, if I have a user event where the user just um, added a gift card and I want that to go out everywhere, um, a message bus is a great way to kind of broadcast those single truth events. Um, and then lastly, if you've got battery, network, um, anything on a mobile device, um, anything on, you know, rotation changes, sometimes it's really nice to use the observable pattern that they build in and let you kind of take in that data and then rebroadcast it, right? So I can have one location listener that translates into my app and broadcast that out inside of my application. All right, so um, some tips really quick just to take away. Um, I know we covered a lot of stuff here. Um, hopefully this is uh, some stuff that sticks that you kind of, next time you've got someone looking at something's complicated, you go, oh, you know, I remember something about that. Um, these are the things to bring back up. This is actually my dog, Casey. Um, she is programming in this picture. We're not hiring any more dogs though. Um, okay, so the first thing. Um, so when you start noticing your code, getting past that first level of depth, right? I, I start having a callback within a callback. Um, two, that's usually, pick a number, right? As a team, pick a number two, two or three is, is generally what you're aiming for. Start refactoring, right? If you get to that number, start thinking about these, all those patterns. This presentation is on GitHub, it's in Reveal.js, so you can actually pull it down. You're welcome to represent it. Um, but um, just keep that in mind whenever you, you see that stuff start nesting. Okay, so I said this a bunch of times, right? Your code should be vertical. Aim for that up and down look to it. If it starts going um, out to that diagonal line, uh, you're, you're, you need to start reining it in. Pull it back towards vertical. Um, focus on how people are gonna read your code, right? So a lot of these patterns are really exciting when you think about them technically, and then you don't really think about how people are gonna trace your code or think about how it, how it flows and how you're gonna um, figure out what's happening. Um, so say, make that a big part of how you think about it. Um, when your view disappears, you see that fanciness? Um, make sure that you deregister, right? All of these patterns have the same problem. Um, if I am gonna have something happen asynchronously and my fragment disappeared or my view got destroyed um, and then I try and run a callback when, it, when um, it's actually done and it's gone, I'm gonna crash. Um, and then, you know, every presentation I feel like says write testable code um, and I'm gonna add a caveat to that for this. Um, write testable functions before you start having that coordination across them, right? Before I do the parallel, before I do the waterfall, test the units. Because when you start getting into really complex flows of async events, you're gonna run into some really tricky bugs. Um, I think I've, I've probably um, said this one a couple of different ways, but all these patterns have pros and cons for different places. Um, there's a tendency for someone to latch onto one of these patterns and then use it everywhere. 
So just try and remember where they fit best. Um, and then lastly, don't reinvent the wheel, right? Don't write your own framework. There's a lot of really good ones. Um, I hope I'm, someone in here isn't like the next framework guru, but most of you don't write the next framework. Um, and uh, I, there's a really good chance that if you do, you're gonna be the only one that understands it. Okay, so I know that was a lot to cover. Um, give it a second, let it burn in. And if you have questions, um, feel free to ask them now. <laughs> All right, I think you were first. Yeah. Imagine the user logs in, and you're making all those Ajax calls <coughs> to get the blogs and the authors and the comments. But in, imagine he presses refresh in his browser. Mm -hmm. So how do you prevent all those Ajax calls to be repeated? Um, HTTP. Uh, I mean, if you're using standard caching and it's an AJAX call and you've got the right cache headers on it, they should actually come back um, in HTTP or you add a, a layer of persistence, right? I think that's the, in a lot of mobile apps we work on, that's the path you head down, right? You start um, adding that extra layer of complexity because you're now storing data locally, you're syncing it. Um, but that's, I mean, I feel like that's the most you can ask for in, in a browser environment. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's talk afterwards. We'll, yeah, you had a question. So I find myself having to write uh, wrappers around callbacks to back up what they expect a document with success and error. Okay. With, with different with one R functions and then async.js requires an uh, error data to R callback. Okay. So what, do you have a silver bullet for that or is there some toolkit somewhere that solves that? Um, no, I, I think I'd actually probably. Let's look at code afterwards because I think I need to look at that one to give you a good answer. Right. Anything else? All right. Well, like I said, on here, feel free to email me. Um, this is my Twitter handle right here. Um, no, seriously, I'm, I'm the one on the left. You're welcome to tweet me. I, I get on Twitter occasionally, but it emails me when you, when you tweet me. So, All right. Well, I guess I